Obviously, the Brexit debate has given, uh, well, once again, put a spotlight on the question of immigration, uh, which has been, from time and uh, from time to time, a big issue in, in Britain. Uh, previously, under the Labour government, when uh, um, Blair was uh, in in charge, uh, and there was a lot about a debate about this question, particularly around asylum seekers. But obviously, of late uh, during the Brexit debate, what we're talking more about is the freedom of movement, the right of EU citizens to move and settle in uh, whatever part of the EU that they wanted to, as long as they could support themselves financially. Um, so. I um, can't really read what I'm write, written here. <laughs> but uh, fundamentally, ca migration has always existed. It's a bit of a, like sometimes you're always presented in political debates that uh, something is a completely new phenomenon. Something, uh, this is a new thing that's never happened before and uh, in order to confuse people, basically, and also take it out of its historical context. Uh, migration is a typical such question. Uh, where you don't really get an explanation for what is taking place uh, in society, how come people are moving between different places of the world or within different countries. Um, you don't really get those explanations, you just get like lots of headlines about numbers and so on, 100,000 here, 100,000 there, and lots of accusations and rumours, etc. Uh, but the reality is migration has existed, uh, well, as long as humanity has existed, of course, people move from different parts for a variety of reasons. Uh, under capitalism, if we try to focus on that, you've had, we've had uh, in the early days of capitalism, the most, there was a very important migration stream that went from the countryside into the cities, or from rural areas, areas into urban areas, because of the need to, uh, for workers in the new industries that were developing. So you have uh, basically uh, landless farmers often, so one of the preconditions of the development of capitalism was the eviction of huge swathes of farmers from their land uh, by landlords which then freed up these, uh, this uh, reserve pool of labour that could then be brought into the cities to work in the factories. And this migration from the countryside into the cities. But that also, in many places, was not just a migration from one within one country but also from uh, one country to another. So for example a lot of Irish migrants uh, would travel to the US where they eventually wound up being factory workers. Uh, Sweden is another example of the whole of Scandinavia, well not Denmark, but Sweden and Norway in particular. A huge numbers, um, I think there's about a million people who left Sweden in the 20 year period uh, to migrate to, to uh, the US. Again, it was the, they were kicked off the land, landlords, were, they, there was a number of reforms introduced which consolidated land owning, which meant these people could no longer be supported on the land, and they were uh, effectively, forcibly, um, they were landless, and they were uh, forced to find their sus means of sustenance somewhere else. And a million of them emigrated to the North America in order to f uh, find either land or employment in the cities. So this is the part and parcel of the history of capitalism, and it hasn't really changed. Um, the US, for example, is notorious for its flexible labor market uh, and its flexible workforce. And every year, about 1.5% of the entire population moves from one census region. So if you divide the US into, I think it's four different regions, it's a lot, quite large regions, 1.5% every year moves from one of those big regions of the US to another. Um, which is like moving basically from one end of Europe to another. Uh, an additional 1.3% of the US population moves from a state to another. So in total 2.8% will move between different states every year uh, of the population. And if you go break it down onto county basis, uh, it's an additional 3%. So in total about 5-6% to 6 will sh move from one county to another. Uh, whether that's uh, the neighbouring county or on the other side of the US. So that's a twentieth of the population every year uh, in the US that moves from one place to another. Um, and these uh, patterns of migration shift over time as industry moves and develops. So North Car Carolina, for example, used to be a quite a static population when it was very agricultural based. Um, uh, and it had, in the beginning, in uh, 1900, 95% of its population was born in North Carolina. 
But today, only 58% of the population of North Carolina was actually born in the state. Uh, and of those 42%, so uh, nine points, so 9% of the population of North Carolina was born abroad. 33% had moved from a different part of the US uh, in all, it, into North Carolina. Then there are other states which are more agricultural based, like Ohio, uh, where, which actually have a more or less consistent proportion of population, about three quarters of the population, which have been consistently born in the state, right? So it's a quarter of the population only that has, uh, migra has moved in there uh, during their lifetime. Uh, a state like California was actually far bigger number of mi well was a bigger number of migrants in 1900 than it is today. So, <laughs> if you know something about the history of California, it was all the gold rush and the whole of development and exploitation of California took place just at the end of the 19th century. So, there were huge numbers of people moving into California, and that uh, was the beginning of California. And even today, still, large numbers of people move from uh, Latin America or from other parts of the U.S into California. Um, over a five year period in the US, 20% of the population have moved from one state to another. And over, if you think of a lifetime of a person, 31% within their lifetime in the US will have moved from one state to another. I mean, if you, you could almost compare it to moving from one country to another in the, uh, Europe in terms of how big uh, uh, Europe one state, one country in Europe is almost as big as, is, I guess, it's a bit bigger than the states in the US, but it's, it's almost similar proportions, right? Sweden, for example, is smaller than most US states, whereas Britain is bigger than most US states. But it's a bit like moving from one country to another, and there's a third of a population every year uh, in their lifetime will move uh, from one state to another in the US. So that's massive. That's 100 million people. Um, and this equivalent figure in the Europe, uh, EU, in spite of all the attempts to, uh, with freedom of movement and so on, to create a more flexible workforce, a more migrating workforce that will move between different countries, the equivalent figure in the EU is, is only 30 million. So you can see that, and then the EU, EU has uh, twice the population, or not quite, but like, it's almost twice the population of the US. So you, you can see the differences in the US labor market, how it works, and the amount of mi migration that takes place, if you're not talking about international, but within the, uh, the same nation state. You have a large, huge numbers of people moving across, and it's the part of the key to the economic development. The reasons that migrants cite for moving from one state to another in the surveys 41% say uh, it's because they're looking for a new job or uh, they're looking for a job. So they're moving because they think they get another get a job in a, another place or because they have found another job. On top of that, another 21% cite what is a rather uh, bad uh, category, but it's other family reason. But I suspect that other family reason probably includes your spouse, your partner, your wife, your husband has found a job in a different place and you're following them. Because that wasn't part of the questionnaire. So I suspect that a lot of people, so probably around half of the migrants basically move in order to uh, find a job somewhere else in the US. So this is, uh, um, this is what, uh, this mobile workforce is part of what they call the economic miracle in the US or the development of the US economy, which has allowed also the capitalists to move industries around the US exploiting uh, parts of the US where there isn't trade unionized workforce. So typically in the north, in the north uh, east, there was well unionized workers in the 1950s and 60s with work good terms and conditions. But uh, so in order to undermine that, to find cheaper labor, they moved the industries first to the uh, Midwest and later on to the south. Uh, and so they move these industries around in order to try to find new uh, work, uh, new workers who will be easier to exploit, to be able to get in uh, worse terms and conditions. And obviously part of that is also the ability then to suck some of the workers from different parts into these um, new industries that were built. Um, in the UK, just over one million people moved from one region of another of the UK, and these are quite large regions. So Wales is one region, for example. Scotland is one region. London is one region. So about one million people moved from one region to another in 2010, which is the year of the last census. There's another one coming out 
soon. Uh, an additional 700,000 people came from abroad. So even uh, within, within Br Britain, which is one of the higher rates of migration in the EU, it's still, uh, so that, that works out around 2.5% if you add those two numbers up, which is still far below the 5 to 6% that you have in, uh, have in the US. So the US is, is quite uh, unique in this uh, context. Or, um, yeah. So the key to understanding uh, migration lies in understanding the capitalist economy. First and foremost, if you look at the big flows of migrants globally between countries, uh, no mind within countries, uh, these are, um, they are based uh, not uh, on uh, refugees, but on people migrating for economic reasons. The largest streams of migrants come from India, Mexico, Russia and Bangladesh, none of which have particularly significant um, political or uh, uh, problems or wars. Um, uh, and they together account for 60 million refugees, or 60 million migrants, sorry. The number of migrants from Syria, which is uh, very large, is large, but it's only 7 million. So if you compare the 60 million to the 7 million, you can see that uh, the difference. I think, uh, yeah, I actually have the figures for India here. I mean, in one sense, it's not surprising because India is the largest, most populous nation in the world. So that they have the largest number of migrants is maybe not so surprising. Um, but or there is also uh, Russia is the third largest source of migrants with 10 million. And China is the fourth largest. So it's the biggest nations that produce the more, uh, most migrants. <coughs> Um, Syria and uh, 7 million, as I said, the Afghanistan is 5 million. Now for those countries, obviously this represents a huge devastating impact of uh, the wars in those countries. As a proportion of the population, we're talking about almost well, more than half or half the population, which is extreme. And obviously the dislocation, the uh, anguish, uh, the misery that has been caused in these countries by imperialist war is uh, tremendous. Uh, but if you compare it to the number of economic migrants, it's, uh, it's the smaller figure. Um, Europeans and North Americans often think of themselves as being the only destination for migrants. That everyone just wants to come here and uh, that's it. But um, 80 million of migrants reside in Asian countries. And it's not just Japan. In fact, Japan has relatively few. Compared to 78 million in Europe, and within the 78 million, 30 of them are, well, actually more than 30 maybe, uh, a quite substantial portion of those 78 million are from within Europe itself. 58 million are in North America, many of them, well, the bulk of them from uh, Latin America and Central America, Caribbean and so on. Africa has 25 million migrants. Uh, and out of those 78 in Europe, 11 million are, uh, are in Russia. So actually Russia is the biggest uh, destination for migrants in Europe, which probably most people don't know. Coming from uh, Ukraine and Kazakhstan. Um, uh, but obviously the point being about economic migration is you tend to move to the richer countries because that's where the jobs are, effectively. So uh, in general, obviously North America and Europe are overrepresented in terms of the number of migrants that move there because that is where the jobs are, that's where the needs of a capitalist economy, where these workers are needed. Uh, one stream, large stream of money, uh, sorry, money, migrants in the last few years have been uh, the Gulf states. And it's really, it's just some re, these are very peculiar states where you have a very relatively small population that suddenly had a large influx uh, of money through oil and gas. And this has created a very peculiar situation. So in UAE, United Arab Emirates, 88 of the population were actually born abroad. 74% in Kuwait, 76% in Qatar, 51% uh, in Bahrain, and Saudi Arabia has 30%. So in these countries, you got like a narrow crust, narrow thin layer of the top of natives, and the whole of the working class almost entirely is made up of migrants who work in construction, um, uh, domestic work, uh, and so on, in all kinds of uh, positions. Um, uh, drawn in from countries like India, Egypt, and Pakistan, 
obviously buy the oil wealth, which enable them, uh, these countries then to create like whole uh, very peculiar, these very peculiar uh, eco economies. The, they have a special uh, system for migration called kafala, and it's, a very, it's the most extreme form, I think, of migrant exploitation that exists in the world. But you can see also that some of the elements of that is what is being introduced in the US uh, and in uh, Europe or has been introduced over the past few decades. Um, the migrants' visas are tied to a single employer. So if they lose their job, they're out. They have to, they're sent home. They're not allowed family reunification. Basically, not allowed to bring family members from where for they come from, which is otherwise standard. Uh, they're not allowed to marry locals, so they're not allowed to marry natives, so it's a big, there's a racial segregation. In fact, Denmark has introduced a few similar things over the past decades. Uh, and they have restrictions on their movements. So this drives a clear, sharp wedge between the native population, or the native working class, in the sense that in those places where it exists, and, um, and the migrants who are completely derived of all the normal rights that you would associate with being a citizen or a resident of a country. Uh, and this is like, well, you know, this is managed migration or immigration and border controls in the most pure naked form. This is the most ripe that migrants can be for exploitation in these kind of situations. Um, so, uh, these, uh, so obviously these migrants are part and parcel of the world market and the world economy. They move these workers across the world, the labor market as they call it, move them across the world in order to be able to fit the different positions of the capitalist system. The, con uh, the uh, work that is being opened up in new industries or in domestic work, in construction or whatever. And so you bring in these migrants from different parts of the world in order to fill these uh, uh, tasks. Uh, and particularly the low paid, obviously. There are some... Um, we can ignore that. Um, there's also, if you call that maybe the pull factor, that is that the sort of attraction of moving to another country, there's, there's something that's needed in that country, and they need those migrants for work. But there's also a push factor, of course. Wars and calamities um, are part and parcel of uh, class society, uh, and the capitalist system in particular. Um, and you often present, see them presented in the press as something that is... Uh, uh, like a fact of life, it's something natural. Uh, wars just take place, it's just because people are bad, you know, they're sinful people, they're evil people in the world and therefore you have wars. But in reality, if you look at all the major sources of conflict in the world, and if you look at the major source of migrants uh, in Syria and Afga uh, or refugees in Syria and Afghanistan, you can see that it's not just some, someone who's got some bad ideas in their head or someone who happens to be particularly evil but it's actually the meddling of imperialist powers, or regional imperialist powers, that are, are the source of it. So the war in Syria, it's a proxy war for all the imperialist powers. It's the poor people of Syria who are basically subject to all the interventions of every single uh, major nation in the world. The European Union is there, the Russians are there, the Americans are there, but not just the international, the sort of global imperialist powers, but also the regional ones, the Saudis who were there backing uh, Yapal al-Nusra in the past, you had the Turks there backing ISIS, and now they're backing some other uh, Islamist nutcases. They're obviously intervening themselves with bombs and uh, even tanks, now against the Kurds. Uh, you have Iran, which is present there. You have also Israel, who's been bombing, uh, although not present on the ground, but obviously the security services will be involved. So you have all the... And they are all fighting a proxy war for control over Syria. And obviously the people that suffer from this is not the uh, rich and the powerful, but the uh, workers and peasants of Syria who have had their lives absolutely destroyed. Uh, and this is what this migration stream comes from, which then, wants up in, uh, which then moves towards Europe, which is a place of relative safety and where they can possibly find some work, etc., uh, and housing. But the European Union very graciously pays Turkey some billions to keep them locked up in refugee camps uh, uh, in a state of misery. So, um, um, and the same goes for Afghanistan, which obviously started with the, with the misery in Afghanistan, started with the US intervention uh, to, to crush the Saudi revolution where they uh, supported people like Osama bin Laden and others, the so-called freedom fighters. Um, 
and then have continued since the withdrawal of the Soviet Union by various, uh, by a proxy wars between uh, regional powers, India, Pakistan, Iran, uh, China, US, of course, um, Russia, I think, has not been so much involved, but they're all, all these uh, regional powers, as well as the US, have been involved in these uh, wars uh, in Afghanistan, uh, and uh, which has caused tremendous dis uh, misery for the population for now, ever since the beginning of the 1980s. Now, so if this is migration, right? If this is get migration on the capitalism. If we understand that this is the source of migration <coughs> in the capitalism, is the reason why we have migration. Um, what should our attitude uh, be? Well, we have to say that in a social society, the question of migration would be posed quite differently. There would be no need for workers to travel across the world to find jobs. Why on earth would you create, build a factory in one part of the world only to force people to move all the way across the world in order to work in this factory? Why don't you build the factory or build, make, create the jobs in the places where pe people already live? And this goes for the north of England, uh, which has uh, got very few jobs compared to the south of England, right? This goes for much for that as it goes for uh, globally, right? Why would you create all this, build all these industries, so to create all these jobs in Europe and North America, rather than actually making them where people live and where they have their families and so on? Which is probably where most people would prefer, right? They don't want to move all the way across the world in order to find a decent uh, job and decent living conditions. They much prefer uh, to, grow, uh, to continue to live in the communities where they grew up. Um, so this is, uh, in a sense, this is part of workers' control. Workers' control of industry. We control where the industries are built. We decide, uh, we create, build the industries not for the purpose of creating profit, so we don't put the factories where we create the most profit, but for the needs of uh, mankind, right? So we build the factories to produce for mankind, but also in the places where uh, they are most, where people already exist. So the machine uh, and the industry to serve the worker rather than uh, serving the needs or rather than the worker being there to serve the needs of the machine, which is the case under capitalism. Um, and yeah, as I said, this also applies within countries. So you don't have this absurd situation which has had to take place, particularly in those countries which have been deindustrializing, like Britain, where you have all the jobs uh, created in a few metropolitan cities. Uh, and so everyone has to move into these big cities, creating massive problems of overcrowding, rather than uh, building, creating jobs across the country where, so people can stay and live in the communities where they, they were already relatively well provided with housing and so on. Um, and obviously we would, as in a social society, in advanced capitalist countries, they would invest in the, what they call the global south or the developing countries in order to, uh, as an act of solidarity, but also as a, way, uh, as a uh, means of cooperating in order to create, jointly create more and more wealth for humanity. So there wouldn't be this need, there wouldn't be this competition of like, uh, you know, seeing um, that we have to put up walls and barriers for all these poor people that want to come here and take away all our wealth, which is how it's been seen, presented in the capitalist press. But actually, we would create that wealth in the South or in all the poorer countries of the world. We build up those industries and create the wealth, which also would benefit us. Because in various ways, whatever they produce in those countries, the uh, engineering, the in all that creativity which uh, exists, in, uh, the talent that exists in those countries, could be brought to bear also to enrich the lives of people uh, in the presently rich, richer world. Um, of course, also, there would be freedom of movement um, uh, across the world and people would be able to move if they wanted to to move to change to for because they wanted a change of scenery a change of climate or there was a, they wanted to work in a particular industry which are only part of a certain part of the world or they wanted to do research if they were scientists or whatever all that stuff we would have complete freedom of movement so people could move and settle where where they wish to uh, but such as such would be um, the case in the social society Obviously, we're not there at the moment, so we also have to discuss how, what, how we pose things uh, in the ca under capitalism. And um, I don't know if you noticed, I don't know, does anyone know, if, how, how much does it cost, if you're really rich, how much does it cost to get a visa to Britain? Does anyone have any clue? 800 pounds. 800 pounds? No, no, no. Uh, I think a lot, too many people will be able to afford 800 pounds, I'm afraid. Uh, it's... Um, it's the figure is uh, it's uh, 
50,000 pounds if it's a startup. Yeah, if you start a new company, like a startup, if you're an entrepreneur, blah, 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 then you have 50,000 pounds you have to invest. If you're not really very creative, you don't really have a new business plan, a business idea or anything, uh, two million pounds would suffice. So if you have two million pounds, you can buy yourself a permanent uh, right to remain in Britain. And most countries have this kind of system in one way or another, either informally, as in you nudge, nudge, uh, you talk to the right people, they will, the government will grant you a visa, or formally, as in the case here, right? Two million pounds, welcome. Um, a lot of tax savings incidentally have similar systems, which are sometimes a bit cheaper than two million. But anyway, uh, if you want planning of uh, migrating to a tax haven. Um, uh, but basically, when we're talking about these kind of systems exist for rich people, if I, I've, I've told also that if you're moving from private airports, between different private airports, so you're not going through, so you have a private jet and you're flying to different private airports, they don't, not, usually don't check passports, so you can really move quite freely between different countries as long as you just have a private jet, which obviously most of the population don't. Um, so uh, obviously you don't want to interfere with these people, the important people, their time is valuable and so I don't want to bother them with passport controls and things like that. So I think that's, so for rich people, freedom of movement across the world really already exists. They don't have, have no, basically have no restrictions to their freedom of movement unless for some reason they fall foul of the US or something like that. Um, so when we talk about the restriction of migration, it is always about poor people or workers. That's always... It's what we're talking about. It's the poor people are the problem, um, uh, and that has to be dealt with. Uh, whereas rich people are an asset. They come here and they bring money to invest. Well, the question is whether you want their money, but anyway. Um, so the, they're, they're always seen as the, uh, uh, an asset. It's something good. It's something, they contribute something to society, unlike workers. Um, this is um, uh, the case. So we, so. I'd like to, so I'd like to go through a little bit historically as well, how the labor movement has uh, uh, dealt with this question, uh, in the, uh, how, or how they dealt with it in the correct way, primarily. Um, and there's always been a dis discussion, it's a long discussion which has already ex always existed in the labor movement, and any attempt to pretend, pretend that this has a new problem, a new phenomena that has never existed before, which you get sometimes, it's complete nonsense. Exactly the same arguments, exactly the same positions have been put forward. Uh, and in Marx's days, in Britain, the main problem was the Irish migrants, or well, problem as it was perceived, who were brought here from Ireland, as you might know, the potato famine happened in the uh, 1850s, and uh, like two million people moved from Ireland. In fact, the population before the potato famine of Ireland was larger than it is today, uh, still. And a lot of these people wound up in Britain, uh, inevitably, uh, and they were brought here and they were, uh, they were given worse terms and conditions to work for uh, in Britain than uh, uh, the people who were born in Britain. And this obviously caused friction between the Irish and the British workers. Um, oh, I've lost my papers in. There we go. So um, Marx uh, fought for uh, the adoption in the British labour movement, in particular in the First International, which had a lot of British unions, uh, trade unions attached to it. He fought for the adoption of an internationalist approach to the question. And so he analysed the problem. He said, owing to the constantly increasing concentration of these holds, Ireland constantly sends her own surplus to the English labour market and thus forces down wages and lowers the material moral position of the English working class. And most important of all, every industrial and commercial centre in England now possesses a working class divided into two hostile camps, English proletarians and Irish proletarians. So he basically analyzes this problem of creation of two separate parts of working class with different terms and conditions which have been pitted against each other. Um, he furthermore describes the attitude which brings about this situation. The ordinary English worker hates the Irish worker as a competitor who lowers his standard of life. In relation to the Irish worker, he regards himself as a member of the ruling nation. In consequences, he becomes a tool of the English aristocrats and capitalists against uh, Ireland, but thus strengthening their domination over himself. 
He cherishes religious, social and national prejudices against his Irish worker. His attitude towards him is much the same as that of the poor whites to the Negroes in the former slave states of the USA. The Irishman pays him back with interest in his own money. He sees in the English worker both the accomplished and the stupid tool of the English rulers of Ireland. And he also points out that the capitalist class is deliberately keeping this division alive. This antagonism is artificially kept alive and intensified by the press, the pulpit, the comic papers, in short, by all the means at the disposal of the ruling classes. The antagonism is the secret of the impotence of the English working class. Despite this organization, it is the secret by which the capitalist class maintains its power, and the latter is quite aware of this. So he basically explains precisely the situation we have today, although on a smaller scale to some extent, where migrants are constantly be hounded in the press, being, uh, being born to be the culprits of all kinds of bad things that are taking place in society, housing shortage, uh, shortage of hospital beds, uh, bad schools, lack of, uh, lack of schools, uh, terrorism, you name it, anything bad, knife crime of course, all the bad things in society are all the source of fault, faults of migrants and not of the capitalist class. And this kind of thing still continues uh, to this day. You have... Um, um, and so history, there was at that time, as much as there is today, a um, uh, layer of the labor movement who adapted, to, in particular in the trade unions, who adapted to a certain wing of the capitalist class, uh, and they adopted the class collaborationist position on this question. What does that mean? The basic idea is that the state should restrict the numbers of workers coming from abroad, in the back in the day from Ireland. Uh, this would create a smaller pool of workers. This is the argument today, if uh, regarding the EU. If you have a smaller pool of workers, um, then it makes it easier for trade unions to negotiate the contract because you have a smaller pool of workers. That's your the demand and supply and so on. Um, uh, or if you put it more crudely, they would ask the state to stop poor foreigners coming in or even send them home uh, from abroad. Ha, look at that. Should have started giving me number, minutes before. Um, so the point that Marx makes is basically this is the Achilles heel of the British labor movement. This is a secret to the weakness of the British working class. And so the question is then, how do you resolve this problem? Now, the funny thing is, recently the, neo the Stalinists, or neo-Stalinists, or whatever we want to call them, they've taken to quoting this passage, which I just read out, as an argument for that we should restrict the numbers of EU migrants <coughs> into Britain, which is a rather peculiar way of twisting and turning the words of Marx. I mean, the only, I mean, I, if you look at what they write, and then you look at, you realize that what I've done is they've found this quote in someone else's writings, and they just copied and pasted it without actually reading the original text in full, what comes before and what comes after. That's the only explanation you could possibly have it. There's another quote as well, which was uh, uh, quoted by Len McCluskey, uh, got a little bit further on, in one of the articles in the Morning Star. The Morning Star takes Precisely this position, by the way, the British Communist, Communist Party of Britain. Um, and they take a little quote outside, out of Paris, like one sentence out of a, a whole paragraph. And then they say, oh, look at this. Marx says there's a problem with migrants, therefore we must close the borders. Uh, or we must, and this is completely absurd. And you realize that they only, uh, well, if they're not completely disingenuous, which is, of course, a possibility, but I think more likely they're just completely lazy and have, have, can't be bothered to read even the whole paragraph in which they've taken this quote out of. They just basically Googled something and then found the little sentence they liked and taken that out and said, oh, look, this is what Marx thinks. Um, uh, but... Um, but the position they develop is basically we need to close down freedom of movement because this will strengthen uh, the British working class because they'll have a ne better negotiating position. And this is uh, uh, quite contrary to the methods that Marx adopted because when he talks in the following paragraph, Marx then tried to come up with some solutions to this problem of attempting to unite the British and the Irish workers. And he says the following. It is the special task of the Central Council of the First International, that is, in London to make the English workers realize that for them, the national emancipation of Ireland is not a question of abstract justice or human sentiment, but the first condition of their own social emancipation. 
basically uh, that the British labour movement should argue for the independence of Ireland in order to win over the Irish workers who are residing in Britain. They should prove to the Irish workers they are on their stride against British imperialism and British capitalism, and that will open the door then for united struggle against the British bosses. Um, uh, and that was the kind of approach that Marx advocated, which is actually, uh, you can tell, is an internationalist approach. It's also a class-based approach, based on the idea of we should unite the working class, not to attempt to divide it, segment it, and so on, but uh, and set, keep one at, on one side of the uh, Irish Sea and one on this side of one on, uh, one side of the channel and, and one on this side of the channel, but actually uniting the workers. Uh, inside the country, those who come from abroad and those who are, uh, were born here, but also across borders, uh, which we return to. Um, this is a similar debate arose a little bit later in the uh, uh, in the U.S. Lab well, uh, well, just after this in the U.S. labor movement, where the AFL adopted um, uh, as well as some construction unions uh, supported the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, which. Are completely racist piece of legislation that was introduced in the US. As you know, a lot of U US migrants came from Europe, but they, are, they um, for various reasons, they took exception to Chinese migrants. So they basically banned all migration into the US uh, by Chinese. They also banned them from taking up jobs in certain industries and so on, which was basically uh, a recipe for creating an underbelly of workers with no rights whatsoever who would be able to be super exploited by the capitalists. And they were uh, super exploited by the capitalists, particularly in the building of railways, which was a big industry at that time. And so this question was raised at the uh, Congresses of the Second International. Um, and there was uh, a delegate called Hillquit, who was particularly right-wing uh, element in the US labor movement, and he raised, which will resonate a lot, to, he put it more crudely, but it's basically the same argument as we hear today. The capitalists import such workforces by, that by nature must be cheaper and in general serve as unwitting strike breakers and who are dangerous competition for native workers. Nowadays, these workforces are Chinese and Japanese, the yellow race in general, we have absolutely no racial prejudice against the Chinese, but we must state that they are completely unorganizable, right? So this is precisely the kind of arguments here in the British labor movement about Polish workers, for example. They're completely impossible to organize. You can't organize Polish workers. It's impossible, and so on. Basically, it's a racial prejudice, but they won't admit it. Um, and also, it's lazy, because they don't want to go out there. They want to translate some leaflets into Polish, they don't want to go out there and try to organize these new workers that are coming in, but rather they just lazily uh, think that the capitalist state will solve the problem for them by just restricting the number of workers that are coming in. And this was, uh, uh, these arguments were answered by a number of uh, people, I can't go into all the quotes, you can read the article, there are more quotes there. Uh, but one of the Italian de delegates uh, argued against it. He says, one cannot fight migrants, only the abuses which arise from immigration. The Italian party and trade unions are always mindful of this. We are against controls on migration because we know that the whip of hunger that cracks behind the migrants is stronger than any law made by government. That is, whatever immigration controls you put in, the whip that of hunger always is stronger than any laws. You're not going to stop migration, even if you ban all migration, it's not going to stop migration because you always have people, because of the situation, the needs of the capitalist economy in those in advanced capitalist countries, as well as obviously the hunger and poverty that's created in other parts of the world. So you always have these streams of migration. The question is not that. The question is what rights uh, do these people that come here have? And what ability do you have to organize them? If they have no rights, it's going to be far more difficult to, to organize them. There are examples of this, uh, I know for a fact, the cleaners when they organized uh, against UBS Bank. Uh, UBS Bank had outsourced their uh, cleaners to Mighty. Uh, so Mighty then had a, the thing, and some of the cleaners were there illegally, some of the leaders of the strike were there, w didn't have proper legal status. And so uh, the company was aware of this, didn't care anything about it, they were quite happy with this situation, until of course when they went on strike. Then they call in um, the, um, one of the cleaners for an interview or a discussion with the management, which is, you know, these things happen when you're working. You have to go and talk to the management. And what do they find when they arrive? Immigration officials. 
who had the, so the management had called up the immigration officials saying, hey, we got this person who's not here legally, uh, would you come and uh, arrest them? Uh, and immigration officials very kindly turned up. And this is what creates uh, this kind of situation which created for migrants if they don't have proper legal status. So you're always under threat, basically. If you stand up for yourself, if you stand up for your rights, you, you face the threat of deportation. And this uh, can only weaken uh, the labor movement. So the, sec the Second International at this meeting in 1907, they actually adopted a, a resolution which ran quite contrary to the intentions of Hilprit and his uh, li like. And they said that um, they regarded all migration controls as reactionary by nature. Fairly straightforward, clear what they meant. There's a little explanation here what you when you have presentations, what you have is humor, clarity, and examples. So I'm trying to work according to this. So clarity <laughs> is clear here. Yeah? And there you have the humor as well. I managed to get a few laughs. Um, and then they had a series of measures to counter, uh, to strengthen the labor movement in the recipient country, where the place where the migrants were moved to. A ban on the export and import of those workers who have agreed on a contract that deprives them on, of their free disposal of their labor power and wages. Basically, they must, all the workers must have the free, the rights to remain, they must have the right to choose whatever employee they want, and so on. They must, um, so there can be no kind of slavery contracts that should be banned, which is fair enough. Statutory protection of workers by shortening the working day, introducing a minimum wage, abolishing the sweat system and regulating home working. Abolition of all restrictions which prevent certain nationalities or races from staying in the country or which exclude them from social, political and economic rights of the natives or impede them exercising those rights. Extensive measures to facilitate naturalization. Basically attempt to join up, to create unity and uh, give all the rights to all the migrants that come there because that will strengthen and facilitate their involvement in the labor movement of the country which they arrived to. Uh, all additional trade unions must remove all restrictions on migrants becoming members, which uh, should be fairly obvious, but historically it hasn't always been the case. And this will strive to strengthen the trade union movement by uniting the migrants and uh, the uh, workers, native workers, if you will. Uh, Lenin spoke in even harsher terms about these kind of tendencies to want to restrict migration. Um, he said that he called it, this is the same spirit of aristocrac aristocraticism, Arix yeah, whatever, that one finds among workers in some of the civilized, in inverted commas, countries, who derive certain advantages from their privileged position and are therefore inclined to forget the need for international class solidarity. Um, and he sa said the resolution of the Second International fully meets the demands of revolutionary social democracy. So he actually he explained this is a narrow-minded uh, labor aristocratic attitude that uh, is reflected in these demands to restrict migration. He also insists that, that migration in fact was pro progressive. The bourgeois incites the workers of one nation against those of another in the endeavor to keep them disunited. Class conscious workers realizing that the breakdown of all national barriers by capitalism is inevitable and progressive are trying to help to enlighten and organize their fellow workers from the backward countries. So this is the attitude of Lenin. Basically, the breakdown of national barriers is inevitable and progressive. So you have the Stalinists, who are mo often uh, the pro uh, proponents of these migration restrictions, as well as reformists, of course, um, who have completely abandoned all internationalism, and they see the nation state as somehow something progressive. But it's not at all. It's actually the breakdown of nation state which is the most progressive thing. And the movement of people actually serves to, uh, serves to help that process along. Removes cultural uh, prejudices, religious prejudices. Basically, if you have a neighbor who is Muslim or Jewish, you're less likely to be prejudiced against such workers than if you didn't have that, right? And in terms of international solidarity, obviously the presence of large communities in Britain or from various parts of the world makes the case of the, the ability of British imperialism to engage in wars and uh, imperialist warfare in those countries also more difficult. So the mm -hmm. issue uniting all the working class, the moving of different people from different parts of the world actually served to strengthen the revolutionary movement. Um, um, Keep that one for later. Now, 
I do not have time, I might be able to go into it later, but to go into the position that uh, uh, the British Labour movement adopted of late. Uh, suffice to say that actually it's quite interesting to ha what happened at Labour Party Congress. On the last day of Labour Party Congress, when a lot of the delegates and a lot of the trade union leaders and whatever had left because there was going to be uh, the parliament was going to reopen and everyone was really happy because parliament was going to reopen. Uh, no one else was. Um, but uh, yeah. Uh, the, a lot of the, and then on that day, they put, they put, there was the <laughs> resolution on migration, homelessness, and a number of other questions. And they actually adopted a program which was, I mean, wasn't, wasn't complete, but actually the basic principles were correct, was the adoption of uh, yeah, the maintenance of freedom of movement for EU citizens and the extending of it to include other people as well, which I think is the correct position. I mean, it's, it's not uh, it's not the complete uh, program, but it, it, it's a very good start. Also, in addition, the extension of uh, the right to vote to people who are living here but are not British citizens, which is perfectly correct as well, perfectly in line with what uh, Second International's resolution. Now, uh, I know part of the reason behind that is obviously these people <coughs> hoping that these that uh, EU migrants in Britain will vote for remaining in the European Union in the future sec second referendum or whatever. But basically, the principle is correct anyway. Um, that why if someone has worked here, like myself, I've been here for 13 years or something, but I haven't got the right to vote because I haven't paid uh, 1,700 pounds they cost to apply, 1,500 pounds they cost to apply for British citizenship. So because of that, I don't have the right to vote, don't have full rights to participate in the political life of Britain. Now, as a person in that situation, why on earth were they not allowed to vote, right? Where some expat in southern Spain who has very little to do with Britain, um, Daisy is smiling here, um, but uh, why do they get the chance to vote? They, they could have vo should vote to Spain, they shouldn't be voting in Britain, basically. Uh, this is the, the logic. I mean, you can also talk about the expats, the Swedish expats, always vote for the Tories who live in London. Uh, there's a tax dodgers, there's a community of tax dodgers in London, basically, 20,000 of them or so. Uh, who are escaping Swedish taxes, enjoying the wonders of the British tax system with the non-DOM status and whatnot. And so they live here and they always vote for the Conservative Party. Uh, the only party that sends uh, uh, election materials to London is the uh, Conservative Party uh, in, Swe in the Swedish elections. Um, anyway, that's by the by. Uh, the Third International also adopted a re resolution on the question of... There's a section in the, re in the resolution on uh, the colonial question, which deals with uh, migration. And it's also, again, I mean, the Stalinists just haven't read any of this stuff. It's quite obvious. Or if they've read it, they must. Um, the, it says, the Communist parties of the United States, Canada and Australia must wage a vigorous campaign against laws that restrict immigration and explain, explain to the proletarian masses of these countries that they too will suffer harm because of the race hatred stirred up by these laws. The capitalists oppose such anti-immigration anti laws because they favor free importation of cheap colored labor as a means of driving down the wages of white workers. So that's the argument basically of a lot of these people that, oh well, importation migrants drives down the wages and so on. But this is, this is not that the third international, the second international didn't know about this thing, but they just about the measures that they deal with it, that's the question. There's only one way to successfully counter the capitalist intention to go over to the offensive. The immigrant workers must be admitted into the existing trade unions of white workers, this particular problem in the United States. At the same time, the demand must be raised that the wages of the colored workers be brought up to the same level as the white workers pay. Such a step by the Communist Party will expose the capitalist intentions and also demonstrate clearly to the colored workers that the international proletariat does not harbor any racial prejudice. Basically, this is the way to unite the uh, work, the, um, the workers, the migrants, and uh, native-born uh, into common struggle against the capitalist class. It's ensure that they get all the same rights, to fight for all the same rights for the migrants as already existed. And the, precisely the opposite will happen if you start into playing around with these migration controls and so on. Precisely the opposite will happen. You will drive a wedge. Basically, the capitalists will continue to import migrants, but they will say to the migrants that have come in and say, look, we'll protect you against these white workers or the native-born workers, right, with their rights and so on. They want to kick you out of the country and so on. We don't want that. We want you here. We want to give you jobs, etc." And obviously that argument will have some truck if all the white workers of well, the uh, main labor movement, if their program is 
uh, no more people for, allowed to come in, no rights, no citizenship rights, etc., etc. So certainly th this is uh, um, the way forward. And it's always been in the traditions, the best traditions of, of the international labor movement, this has been a position that has been uh, put forward. It is the best way of strengthening and unifying the labor movement against, in the struggle against the bourgeoisie. Um, I will not have time for that either. Um, and also, it is also a way of fighting against this idea which is being put forward. Uh, they have, in, both in Britain and the United States, you have this kind of, this argue, like this kind of, well, I guess in all countries, but particularly in Britain and the United States, they have this wing of a bourgeoisie who like to present themselves as somehow progressive. Uh, you got the Hillary Clintons of this world, or uh, in Britain, uh, the pro-Remain, so the Joe Swinsons or whatever, who talk a lot about being in favour of nice things, uh, rights for migrants and so on. Uh, but in reality, they're not in favour of no such thing at all. But what they want to do, they, well, they have a minor difference with people like Trump, in that they like some of the methods of Trump, and how he, he, some of the harshest measures they think are a bit too harsh, they want to let in a little bit more migrants than maybe Trump wants. Um, or in Britain, the Remain crowd, a lot of them are in favor <coughs> of restricting freedom of movement. They just don't want to abolish it completely, right? Because they understand that the British economy needs these workers who work in the picking strawberries or whatever. They need these workers, uh, low paid workers, and they continue to need them even in the future. So it's not a question. So they and their attitude is to have a little bit more restrictions or uh, bring in some more migrants, but ne no, none of them are really in favor of giving full rights uh, to migrants, giving citizenship rights to migrants, or uh, allowing uh, anything close to open borders. So in reality, the, the, po uh, uh, the policy that has always been put forward by the revolutionary wing of the labor movement. It's always been uh, not just directed against uh, the right wing of the labor movement or uh, the sort of uh, Nigel Farage's of this world, but also directed against this liberal wing of the bourgeois who tries to present themselves as some kind of friends of the migrants uh, or friend or, or internationalists, as they like to call themselves. Um, and in the future, in the, with the hardening of the class struggle, inevitably this divide and rule tactic will be used again and again. It is our essential duty to maintain a clear position of class independence on this question, no alliance with either the so-called liberals or the uh, uh, Nigel Farage's of this world. Um, we do not side with the bosses who are pretending to be a friend of an native worker by blocking the foreign one, nor with, do with the one who pretends to be the friend of the foreign worker by advocating a more permissive migration policy. Our policy is for class unity and internationalism, and on that road lies the success of our movement. Thank you.